Thank you and good morning. On behalf of the Bureau of Justice Assistance, I want to join Suzanne in welcoming you uh, today to day two of our Justice and Mental Health uh, Collaboration Program and Conference. Um, and I really want to thank the Council of State Governments, Mike Thompson, Suzanne, and their entire team uh, for the incredible work they've done in pulling together this conference and the Second Chance Act Conference that will begin tomorrow. I also want to recognize uh, my staff at BJA, uh, beginning with the Associate Deputy Director, Ruby Kalsabash, who leads this important work at, at BJA, and thank them for their tireless and enthusiastic support um, in these important areas. I also want to congratulate our new Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program grantees that convened yesterday and welcome our past and current um, grantees that have joined us uh, today. Thank you for taking the time um, to work on this critically important challenge. You are making such a difference in your communities, and we are so pleased uh, to work in partnership with you as you tackle better systems responses to justice-involved persons with serious mental illness in your community. I'm excited not only by your individual grant programs um, that you are working on in your communities, but also on the growing efforts and partnerships focused on making the kind of real systems reform that we need to change and to address root causes and sustain these efforts over time. Yesterday, in yesterday's opening remarks, uh, the audience heard about the Stepping Up Initiative, an important initiative BJA supports, along with our partners, the Council of State Governments, Justice Center, NAMI, the American Psychiatric Association Foundation, and the National Association of Counties. Stepping up is about working at the local level in counties all across the country to reduce the prevalence of people with serious mental illness in our nation's jails and to connect them to the needed treatment services in the community. I urge you all to become champions of stepping up in your counties and to connect the cutting edge work that you are doing with that initiative. We could not do the work that we are doing in the justice mental health area without the support of Congress through the Justice Mental Health Collaboration Program. And I want to particularly thank the members of Congress for their support. Working in partnership with all of you, we have been making significant progress. And I want to briefly highlight some examples for you today. Working in partnership with the Council of State Governments at Justice Center and all of you, we've been making significant progress in dealing with so many different areas involving uh, the mental health and criminal justice systems. With some technical assistance from CSG, District Attorney Jackie Lacey is leading efforts in LA County to develop a system-wide response in one of the nation's largest and most diverse counties modeled after the tremendous work done by Judge Leifman and his team in Miami. Last week, I was at a conference in Richmond where two state administrative agencies described how they are leveraging JAG funds to provide crisis intervention training to all the police departments statewide in Virginia and Montana. Two weeks ago, we held a focus group with law enforcement experts to discuss how to better leverage effective co-responder models and specialized police responses in our justice mental health learning sites and police departments in LA, Houston, Salt Lake City, Madison, Wisconsin, Portland, Maine, and the University of Florida. Those learning sites are extremely valuable resources and I urge you to take advantage of them in the work um, that you do with your law enforcement partners. And I am excited about the growth of mental health courts from only four in 1997 to over 300 today, as well as the work underway with the mental health court learning sites and the Council of State Governments to develop evidence-based standards for mental health courts and the programs um, that are serving individuals in those courts. 
BJA is also focused on addressing the needs of justice-involved persons with serious mental illness through other BJA programs for pretrial justice reform, reentry, and the Justice Reinvestment Initiative. This kind of systems change requires strong, cross-disciplinary partnerships between criminal justice and behavioral health practitioners. It requires commitment and innovation. And as we know, neither the criminal justice system nor the mental health system can do this alone, which is a perfect segue to today's panel. Our expert panelists this morning will discuss their unique perspectives and what it will take to reform our system's work together to produce better responses to and better outcomes for community members with serious mental illness who come in contact with our justice system. So I'm excited and to have the privilege to introduce our distinguished speakers for this morning's panel. First, you will hear from Mike Lawler, the Undersecretary for Criminal Justice Policy and Planning for Governor Malloy in Connecticut. Prior to his appointment, Mike served 12 terms as a member of the Connecticut House of Representatives, and while there, served as chairman of the important Judiciary Committee. Mike will be followed by Kana Enomoto, the acting administrator of SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Kana has, dis has had a distinguished career at SAMHSA, having served there for 18 years. Through data, policy, public education, and grants, Ms. Enomoto and the SAMHSA team advanced the agency's mission to reduce the impact of substance abuse and mental health issues on Americans' communities. And I might add, SAMHSA is a great partner to BJA on many important projects, but in particular in our joint drug court solicitation to fund programs for persons with co-occurring substance substance abuse and mental health issues. Finally, I am delighted that we will hear from my friend and former colleague at the Office of Justice Programs, Mary Lou Leary, who serves as the Deputy Director of State, Local, and Tribal Affairs for the White House Office of National Drug Con Control Policy. At ONDCP, Mary Lou directs the office's criminal justice portfolio portfolio and oversees the high-intensity drug trafficking areas HIDA programs. So without further ado, let me begin with Mike Lawler. Mike? <clears throat> well, uh, thank you very much, Denise, and good morning, everybody. I'm sure I speak for at least a few people here when I say how grateful I am that the Giants game did not go to overtime last night and had a happy ending as far as I'm concerned, and uh, so we're ready to roll this morning. Uh, let me, first of all, on behalf of the Council of State Government's Justice Center, uh, congratulate all of you for helping uh, all of our colleagues around the country achieve extraordinary results in recent years. And what I mean by that is there is no question that throughout the entire country, and especially in my state in Connecticut, uh, we are seeing <clears throat> index crime, you know, crime with victims at record lows, at its lowest point since the late 1960s. And I think part of the reason for this is the extraordinary job that all of you are doing at the front lines in sorting out offenders and defendants and ensuring that low risk, high needs uh, individuals are matched up with the kind of supervision and treatment that helps us reduce crime going forward, lower rates of recidivism, fewer people entering the uh, system as first time offenders. Uh, this is the work that you and I as a policymaker help accomplish, and I think uh, it's our obligation to remind people all of the time that things are, in fact, getting better. There are new issues that are popping up, of course, the opioid addiction, et cetera, et cetera, but extraordinary uh, progress is being made uh, by refocusing the criminal justice system on high uh, risk, dangerous offenders, and instead finding other ways of dealing with uh, everybody else and giving police and prosecutors and judges more options uh, to deal appropriately with offenders. Uh, on behalf of the Justice Center, I'd like to tell you one quick story 
that uh, gives you some insight into how we uh, began down this road of exploring the relationship between criminal justice uh, uh, folks and mental health and, and substance abuse folks. Back in the late uh, 1990s, uh, I can remember touring a prison facility in our state and talking to correctional officers. And you know, as if you talk to anybody on the front lines of any enterprise, they typically tell you what they're concerned about, what their complaints are. And I was surprised when correctional officers said to me, you know what our biggest problem is here? There's too many persons in this facility with serious mental illness. We're not trained to deal with them. They make our job more complicated, and it's not right for them to be here for their own good. That was an eye opener uh, for me because you always think that you know corrections guys would be sort of tough on crime, not particularly sympathetic. But this uh, was a very consistent theme in touring facilities in the late 90s, and in the aftermath of that we raised at, at CSG the, the issue of perhaps we should try and find a way to get these two groups of people to work with each other, uh, mental health folks and criminal justice folks. And I can remember vividly uh, when Mike Thompson, who is the executive director of the Justice Center, reached out to folks at SAMHSA, to your predecessors, and said, you know, we think that folks at the Department of Justice would be willing to collaborate with you uh, to get better outcomes. And I think the SAMHSA folks at the time were surprised because there had been this divide between criminal justice people and mental health and service provider people on the other side. And beginning with that, we found that on the front lines throughout the entire country, there was an extraordinary interest in exploring this further. And I think the results speak for themselves. And the best evidence of the results are your, is your presence here today. That this has attracted extraordinary interest and support around the country. It crosses partisan lines. It crosses red state, blue state, urban and rural. Uh, the, 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 the opportunity that has presented itself to all of us is extraordinary. And I think for that reason, it's our collective obligation to double down on the good outcomes we have achieved so far. Um, I just want to add a word about Denise O'Donnell. You know, this initiative has spanned three administrations now, President Clinton, President Bush, and now President Obama. And each administration has given extraordinary support to this. And each administration has identified a key person in the Department of Justice to help lead these efforts. And I think Denise is the best example because from my perspective, she's one of us, right? She has come from a, a state level, a local level, uh, direct involvement in these things and have been able to come here to the federal government and help us do our job. And, and that, I'm sure in the good old days that wasn't always the case, but it's definitely the case now, Denise, and I just want to say thank you for your extraordinary support. And the final thing I want to mention is uh, the difference that these efforts have made in state capitals. You know, as you just heard, I was a legislator for a long time. And uh, back in the mid-90s, the idea of making legislative proposals that dealt with the intersection of criminal justice and mental health was perceived to be a very hazardous enterprise, right? Politicians did not want to talk about people with mental illness and criminals at the same time. There was nothing good that could have come of that in the view of the, the mid-1990s. So much has changed, and I think your work on the front lines has helped make that happen. Your willingness to talk to legislators, to talk to mayors, to talk to governors and governor staffs has really changed the perceptions of what this is all about. And I'm particularly proud that my state, Connecticut, we have a team here from Windsor which are doing just that. Criminal justice folks from the police department, service providers from the community, doing best practices in their own community and a willingness to spread this throughout our state, working with their colleagues from other jurisdictions. That's how change takes place. So thank you all for your efforts. Welcome on behalf of the uh, Council of State Government's Justice Center, and I look forward to all these presentations today. Thanks. And with that, I can't add to Denise's introduction. I thought that was fantastic. So um, I would like to welcome our colleagues from SAMHSA, uh, Acting Administrator Anamoto. Where do I point it? There we go. 
I brought slides so you don't have to look at a 10-foot picture of me. <laughs> that's, that's like a psychological death. <laughs> bad enough in person. Um, no, so thank you. Uh, good morning. And wow, what an honor to be here. This is such an exciting panel and such an incredibly important topic and great partners at the, on the dais. So uh, I appreciate um, uh, what's already been said about uh, the, the fantastic uh, partnership that we've had and the, the blazing, trailblazing work that you've done to forge that understanding of the nexus uh, between behavioral health and criminal justice issues. Ah, they, they took the slides down. Okay. Um, so, so thank you, and, and uh, this is an incredibly important topic for SAMHSA, uh, and I bring you greetings from Secretary Burwell as well. I know she wanted to be here today um, uh, because uh, we, in, even in our discussions around healthcare and health, she uh, is showing increasing interest in reentry issues, in healthcare, in uh, correction settings. Uh, she's also a very strong partner uh, with the Attorney General uh, and has been very supportive of SAMHSA's work in this space. Um, there, nope, there we go. So for a long time, uh, since the 90s even, um, we've understood that the behavioral health safety net just uh, can't stretch far enough to include everybody that it needs to, and that uh, is definitely including people involved with the criminal justice system. You guys know all too well, approximately three quarters of state, federal, and jail inmates meet criteria for either mental health or substance use conditions, uh, which creates higher costs uh, and, uh, and um, more trauma and more challenges, I think, for the staff who work within those systems. Uh, and yet only about 10% of these individuals receive behavioral health services while they're incarcerated. Um, and we at SAMHSA uh, don't have necessarily an authority in the behind the walls, I think, um, but that's why it's so important for us to partner uh, with the Department of Justice uh, as we move forward in this space. The, um, the drugs and crime connection uh, is also overlapping with people with mental illnesses, as has already been discussed. Uh, and we know that compared to an 8% rate of serious mental illness in the general population, we're seeing uh, twice that for men and up to four times that for women. Uh, and so we have a very, very vulnerable population who really, um, as you know, need services more than, um, than they need punishment. Uh, and just a few weeks ago, uh, we're seeing, we have some data that show that we're making progress. In our treatment episode data set, a uh, study on 2013 data, uh, we're looking at um, treatment admissions in, the, in, in substance abuse settings, and about 34% of our referrals are coming from criminal justice sources. Uh, so that's uh, from probation, parole, state, federal courts, formal adjudications, DUI, DWI, diversionary programs, prisons, and other legal entities. So with one third of our population coming from these criminal justice systems, it means there is a lot of back and forth. It's a two-way uh, exchange. And so we really need to be working in lockstep uh, because if they're not ours now, uh, they, they might be yours later and so forth. And so we're trying to address these critical issues that affect justice involves uh, individuals in a lot of different ways. We have a lot of information to share, but I want to concentrate on a few things. One is how we prioritize CJ populations, what emerging issues we've identified, and then how we're moving the behavioral health field forward toward better serving these populations, including some of the work we're doing around financing and work that's happening across the department. So in order to achieve SAMHSA's missions, we've identified six strategic initiatives, uh, prevention of substance use and mental, mental illness, healthcare and health systems integration, trauma and justice, recovery support, health information technology, and workforce development. In the trauma and justice space, uh, we are focusing on um, understanding uh, the awareness of mental and substance use disorders, promoting uh, mental health and wellness, and then getting people who are involved in the justice system uh, or, or helping justice systems also become more aware of trauma, the role of trauma and violence in these people's lives. We know that trauma is ubiquitous among people who are incarcerated, homeless, uh, in residential treatment, who also have mental illnesses and substance use disorders. I feel that I feel very strongly trauma is a is a central organizing factor in people's lives, and so we cannot address one without the other. Otherwise, we continue in this uh, revolving door of, of 
going from system to system to system with the unresolved trauma affecting not only the individual but their family and then those around them who are trying to support them. So within our justice work, we're focusing um, recognizing that behavioral health services and recovery support services are critical but also need to be balanced with the community priority of public safety. So we've created an array of programs, technical assistance centers, resources, and policy initiatives around the sequential intercept model. So I think probably, as most of you know, the model identifies five key points of intercepting individuals with behavioral health problems, linking them to services, preventing further penetration into the criminal justice system, and building on collaboration between criminal justice and behavioral health. So we're highlighting where to intercept individuals as they move through the criminal justice uh, process or system. We are identifying critical decision makers who can authorize movement away from the criminal justice system and into treatment. And we're delineating essential partnerships among mental health, substance abuse, law enforcement, pretrial services, courts, jails, community corrections, social services, and others. And while we're focusing our uh, efforts, uh, many of our efforts, uh, we're, we're trying to sharpen our focus on intercept one, first contact. Uh, but I also wanted to talk to you a little bit about what we're doing on intercept four. Uh, for re-entry efforts, we're using a two-pronged approach. Uh, one is supporting grant programs, such as our SAMHSA ORP program, offender re-entry program, where we're expanding and enhancing substance use treatment services and for people with co-occurring mental health conditions uh, uh, for re-entry. And then we're also, number two, partnering with other federal agencies to address a number of issues related to offender re-entry through policy change, making recommendations to state and local governments, uh, and eliminating myths surrounding offender re-entry. I also want to mention that Council of State Governments Justice Center has been a longtime partner of SAMHSA and uh, we appreciate the work that you do greatly. Um, so SAMHSA uh, is partner, uh, as part of the HHS uh, party that's in the Federal Interagency Reentry Council convened by DOJ. And broadly speaking, the HHS programs and policies within that are enhancing access to general health care, to treatment for behavioral health problems, treatment for opioid addiction, which we know is an issue in so many different places, strengthening family life and parent-child relationships, providing services to the elderly and the homeless, and enabling employment opportunities that foster economic self-sufficiency. So among many of the ongoing areas of work and corresponding activities, HHS is partnering with DOJ to develop materials, webinars, presentations, and work groups to promote enrollment in Medicaid and the marketplace for those involved with the justice system. The Ranchi Council is also overseeing an HIV AIDS demonstration program to improve the health outcomes of formerly incarcerated persons with HIV by supporting community-based efforts to ensure a successful transition to care and other supportive services. And in partnership with uh, the National Institute of Corrections, we're examining the effects of providing incarcerated individuals with an opportunity to have Medicaid in place at the time of release back to the community. We really think this could be a game changer. At the same time, HHS is looking at better ways to serve children and families by focusing on supporting re-entering parents through a grant program in coordination with ACF. And in partnership with DOJ, a website's been developed, youth.gov, to connect caregivers and service providers with resources for children who have one or both parents in the criminal justice system. HHS is also expanding efforts to test the efficacy of job training for non-custodial parents, two-thirds of whom have self-disclosed incarceration. Services include record expungement, legal assistance, and collaboration with the parole office. Additionally, we're taking a closer look at improving opportunities for employment in the healthcare sector, as individuals with a criminal record are often shut out of healthcare employment due to legal barriers and misperceptions of risks. SAMHSA's reentry program will continue to be informed by the reentry council as we work to assist individuals with mental and substance use disorders. The agencies that are receiving the SAMHSA funding are delivering vital services including comprehensive treatment, case management, wraparound services, and medication-assisted treatment. And medication-assisted treatment is one of the issues uh, that um, I felt I, I really wanted to talk about today. Um, as I, I was just in Lac de Flambeau, Wisconsin, and had an opportunity to uh, visit a tribal healing and wellness court. And uh, there were very strong feelings, as some of you might imagine, about uh, folks in their community who are on methadone and on buprenorphine. And with the help of, of, uh, of uh, DOJ and ONDCP, SAMHSA has uh, added a policy to its drug court grants, which um, 
prohibit the exclusion of people who are receiving medication-assisted treatment uh, from participating in uh, the grant services uh, because we know and research has firmly established that MAT for opioid dependence reduces addiction and related criminal activity more effectively and at far less cost in incarceration. And we think that there should not be policy barriers to helping people access these services. But when I visit communities, uh, I, I, and I heard in, in Wisconsin, um, that they're seeing their folks, they get on a bus at 5 a.m., they come back and they are not functional. They're not, they don't go back to work. They don't take care of their families. Uh, and, and they've been doing this for years. And so I think in, with respect to MAT, we understand that there, there are outcomes that we'd like to see that mean that people have to be receiving psychosocial services, people have to be uh, getting a, a pathway toward recovery, and that that's the responsibility of the treatment provider. And so while uh, we don't think, there's not, never a one-size-fits-all, uh, we strongly feel that MAT should be available, but that MAT should be high-quality, recovery-oriented MAT, and we think that is the, um, the responsibility of the justice system and the behavioral health system to make sure that that happens for people. Um, so I want to add a, a piece on the Affordable Care Act uh, as we are getting to a close on open enrollment three. I hope you're helping people find uh, ways to get engaged in either Medicaid or the uh, marketplace. Um, our work in health reform includes a special focus on justice-involved individuals um, because we think that the ACA is going to be critical in, in resolving the coverage gap for people and that uh, agencies that are working with justice-involved individuals can help close that gap. And so we've uh, given some training and support for outreach, engagement, and enrollment. And in conjunction with CMS, we've delivered uh, some materials that explain how law enforcement and justice professionals can help link offenders to health insurance. Uh, we uh, applaud the work that you're doing. Uh, we want to be your partner, and I appreciate uh, everyone being here today and, and being focused on uh, this incredibly vulnerable population that has so much potential. Thank you. And, and then, um, I would also like to uh, thank you so much, Acting Director. And then our final panelist is uh, Deputy Director uh, Mary Lou Leary. And as the crime victim advocate, I can't represent, I can't like miss the opportunity to also mention that in addition to all the impressive things that you heard about her work at ONDCP and OJP, she was also director for the National Center for Victims of Crime. And so for a lot of us in that field, uh, it was profoundly important work that really impacted what we did day to day. So uh, Deputy Director. Thank you. Thank you so much. Excuse me. Thank you for uh, the invitation to join you this morning. It's really quite an impressive group, and I understand the crowds will swell even more tomorrow. So um, it's going to be a great conference. Um, I want to uh, congratulate the uh, CSU Justice Center for the incredible work it has done on criminal justice reform overall and kudos to the Justice Department for focusing national attention on these issues and for spearheading the administration's effort on this with strong support of course from HHS. I'm with the Office of National Drug Control Policy. We're part of the White House and we advise the President on drug policy for uh, the nation. And we're very proud to serve with our federal partners on the administration's reentry um, council, which is chaired by the Attorney General, Loretta Lynch. That council has an amazing, really impressive list of accomplishments that are, the list is far too long to enumerate here. Um, but I, I have to say that the council is engaged more than ever in advancing criminal justice reforms on every front and making sure that incarcerated individuals really do get a second chance. And very importantly, that they are treated with the respect and the dignity that they deserve. This administration is unwavering in its commitment to, to making sure that people who are held back because of their criminal justice involvement, get support, get what they need in order to move on. ONDCP's part of that commitment is reflected in our national drug control strategy. The strategy 
is based on input from public health and public safety research and professionals around the country. And it's based on decades of research. This is a drug policy strategy that is based not on moral judgment, but on science and on evidence. And the bedrock principle of that policy is that addiction is a disease, it's a chronic disease of the brain, and that it can be prevented, that it can be treated, and people can and do recover from it. Now, I know that almost everybody in this room has worked with individuals who have substance use disorder, who have co-occurring mental illness. We're all in this together. And you'll, you'll notice that I, I don't use the word addict and I don't say addiction so much because we really talk about it as a substance use disorder because it is a disease. It's a chronic disease. So we want to expand science-based, evidence-based policy, drug policy, and justice reform. And the work that you do helps us do our work every day. Um, having spent my whole career in criminal justice, about 30 years now, I think we are at an extraordinary moment in time. Because at this moment in time, the discourse around drugs is changing. And it is moving from that traditional kind of war on drugs mentality to an understanding that is and an approach that is much more balanced and that, that does recognize that substance use disorder is a disease. In the past, people with substance use disorders were really thought to be kind of morally flawed and they just didn't have the willpower to get over it. But in, when, we, when we talked about it, and I was a drug prosecutor for many years, when we talked about substance use disorder, it was all in the shadows and all stigmatized. But stigmatization clouds our understanding of reality. And we can't allow individuals who have chronic disease to just spiral downward. We wouldn't do that, somebody with diabetes or heart condition other chronic diseases. We shouldn't do that for people with substance use disorder as well. And you all can be part of the change. You know, as we, as we heard, there's an inextricable link between the criminal justice system and substance use disorders. Kana mentioned that about a third of the referrals to treatment come not from doctors, not from the medical community, but from the criminal justice system about 34% of them. You know, and oftentimes, engagement with the criminal justice system is the first opportunity that an individual has to get into treatment. We need a full array of evidence-based interventions throughout the criminal justice process, from alternatives to arrest, alternatives to prosecution, alternatives to incarceration, all the way on through to treatment behind the walls and reentry support and services. Individuals with substance use disorders have to get that kind of opportunity. We can't waste the opportunity while they are incarcerated. And then they need the kinds of support that you know so well upon release, education, training, um, mental health support, treatment, and so on. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, in many cases, law enforcement is actually taking the lead on this. And this is just amazing to see how things have changed in the last few years. I'll tell you about one example. We met just the other day with Chief Campanello, who's in Gloucester, Massachusetts. He's a police chief in a community that has a dreadful heroin and opioid problem. And he literally, <laughs> understands that you cannot arrest your way out of this problem and it affects everybody in the community. I bet there are a handful of people in this room who don't know somebody or know of somebody in your own community who's been affected by opioid use. But Chief Campanello said, listen, I, I'm, not, I'm not in a war against addicts. I'm not here to arrest addicts. 
I'm here to try to help solve the problem. And so he issued a public proclamation. If you have a substance use problem and you come to the Gloucester Police Department with your drugs, turn them into us if you're ready for treatment. We have a core of volunteers that we call angels. They have been trained to help individuals get into and navigate the treatment system. And so when this first, when he first made this proclamation, people were just amazed. And I told one prosecutor about it and he kind of cynically said, yeah, sure, we'll see how many people take him up on that offer. Well, it's only been uh, less than a year and already 450 people have gone into treatment. And he has treatment centers from the, all over Massachusetts and other states as well offering to take people from his program. And now there are 40 other police departments who have instituted similar programs in their departments. I think this is just extraordinary. And law enforcement leaders around the country are getting on board. This, I think, really demonstrates the need for public health and public safety to come together. Because law enforcement cannot do this alone. Public health cannot do this alone. We have to get together, we have to partner, which really is the essence of what, what you all are doing in your work every day. And I know that many of you work with folks who do have uh, substance use issues. And I hope that you will turn to ONDCP if you need help, if you need resources, if you need examples of other good practices that are going on around the country, because we really applaud the work that you do, and we understand the importance of partnering and of collaboration, and that together we can do so much. This is an amazing, amazing opportunity, a point in time where you've got the left and the right coming together. You've got all these agencies coming together around real criminal justice reform and true second chances. So let's not miss that opportunity. Thank you.